I'm Raphael. You've seen me last week, probably. Who's who's here? Who wasn't there last week? Just to, I mean, it's not to it's not to point fingers. It's just to to know who's there um, and uh, who I, I don't know yet. Just uh, just to give like whatever emoji in the chat, anything you like. Um, but yeah. Um, otherwise, I can introduce myself. But if you already know me. Anyway, I'll, I'll do a very brief intro. I'm a generative artist. I've been on Hicketnung uh, in the very early days. And before that, I've been doing uh, code-based art for um, a little longer than 10 years. I run a, a meetup group, co-host meetups here about creative coding in Berlin. Uh, creative Code Berlin. If you're ever in Berlin, you can come to one of our events. We have two events a month. First Friday is third Saturday of the month. And uh, yeah, I currently work for the Processing Foundation, which uh, supports the development of processing and P5JS, uh, as well as uh, various types of fellowships and, and other programs to uh, make programming more inclusive in general, in the, and in, particularly, in, in particular tech and art, um, teaching artists to code and uh, teaching technologists to art, I suppose. So yeah, uh, that's uh, those are some of the things that I do. I also stream on Twitch uh, about creative coding as well. And I run a weekly challenge, creative code challenge there on Twitch. That's me in a nutshell. And uh, last week we had an introduction to creative coding using P5.js. So first steps with P5.js. And this week, we're going to take a little bit of a tangent uh, from the code itself uh, to look at generative art as a concept. What is it? And how you can make generative art yourself as well as uh, generative NFTs specifically. So um, I've seen in the program for this week that you're going to have a Ask Me Anything session with Zankan at, uh, at the end of the week on Friday, I believe. So yeah, this is uh, this this is going to be great. You're going to have a very basic introduction today, and you can keep researching it until Friday, and then you'll have the best questions for my uh, my fellow Frenchman Zankan on Friday. All right. Um, so let's start with some definitions. So what is generative art? So there is um, there's a very good article that I want to share with you from Amy Goodchild. Um, which is uh, aptly titled "What is Generative Art?" Let me share my screen so I can, uh, I, we can uh, look at it together. Um, uh, da, da, da. Is that, is that? Let me see. Just want to make sure I share my whole screen, not just the app. Yeah, there you go. Okay, you now let me know if you need some time to, I, I don't know, bring it full screen or something for the recording. But otherwise. I'll, uh, I'll move on. So what is generative art? Um, in the case of Amy's title, she, uh, article, she uses a very inclusive definition, which is art created using autonomous processes, and then proceeds to define autonomous processes as a process not under direct human control. So if you try to think what are the consequences of that definition or what falls under the umbrella of such an uh, inclusive definition, there's a lot of things. I, I think, you know, a Pollock painting would be generative art under that definition. Um, a, a lot of things would be generative art under that definition. And honestly, why not? Um, but the kind of generative art that has gotten popular in the last couple of years, uh, especially since 2021, when it really started exploding in the space of like the blockchain space, the crypto space, the NFT space, is code-based, mostly generative art, computer-based generative art. Some of it creating static images, some of it creating animations or even interactive things. And we're going to see what those mean. And I'm going to show you some examples of various artworks that fall under this or that category. But one thing I wanted to say is that, um, you know, definitions are always flawed. They're, they're never going to be fitting precisely or they're going to be too broad. Uh, so definitions are useful for a purpose. So don't get too hung on to like um, any any particular definition. 
But just for the purpose of today, we're going to look at computer code-based generative art. So in this case, the autonomous process that generates the art is going to be an algorithm, a piece of computer code that the artist is writing, sometimes using some randomness, sometimes using some emergent properties of the algorithm. And um, it can, this, this under, not, not under direct control, the direct is an interesting term there because you can make generative art that is entirely deterministic, meaning it, it doesn't really use randomness, but it feels random in the way that these emergent properties, you don't fully understand how they work. And so it's not under your direct control. It might still be under your control, but you don't really see where the control happens. And in this way, it feels more like uh, it's it's an autonomous thing. And I really recommend reading this whole article because it's, it's, it's brilliant. It talks about the work of, of pioneers like Vera Molnar, a wonderful artist. I'm not going to get too deep into any give, given artist today. It's really going to be an overview, but you'll have those references and you can go and do some more research. Um, I was listening this week. I, I just wanted, I forgot that I wanted to include that link, but uh, there's in particular uh, a wonderful podcast called Waiting to be Signed. And uh, I, I really recommend, no, that was, uh, yeah, podcast, Waiting to be Signed. You can find it on all your, all your platforms. And uh, lately they had a, a really brilliant episode with Monk Anthony from The Random. Uh, I don't know if that's, uh, if, you, if anyone at, uh, at VCA is, uh, will or like anyone from Waiting to be Signed ever, uh, ever intervene at VCA, that would be curious uh, because they're they're fantastic and yeah the story of generative art uh this this episode that came out recently uh june 14th really recommend listen and monk anthony said they were working on the timeline of generative art and i want to look it up if i find it if it's already public I'll, I'll share it in the chat after the class uh anyway so yeah this this whole article goes into randomness uh like various particular things about uh, algorithms as well as uh, emergent properties uh, and also a procedural art or rule-based art um, with the example of Soluit. It's a, it's a classic, really a, a wonderful artist who was doing these, these artworks, these wall drawings in particular, that's what he's most famous for, um, which are artworks that are based on instructions, but it's not code. So here you can see on the wall surface, any continuous stretch of wall using hard pencil place 50 points at random. The points should be evenly distributed over the area of the wall. All the points should be connected by straight lines. And then there's various ways this could be interpreted. That's the fun bit. It's like it leaves some room for subjective interpretation. That's not a privilege that we typically have with code-based art because you need to make your instructions work. If your instructions are not specific uh, or the, if they're broken, if they, they have ambiguity, uh, the code is simply not going to run. So, um, so yeah, or you would have to implement this ambiguity yourself, which is a bit of a different thing. In this case, the the human is interpreting the the code if we want to call the instructions code um these instructions are interpreted by a human and a human is is typically more robust than a computer at interpreting instructions uh if you misspell a word the human's still going to be able to to interpret it uh if you say the points should be evenly distributed maybe a different human is going to have a different idea of what it is this is not the same for computers typically they're going to have one way that they interpret the code um, so yeah, we're getting into the weeds a little bit, but, uh, I wanted to, to talk about this before we move on. Okay. So further definitions, uh, and by the way, if you have any questions, please do feel free to, to tell me in the chat. I, uh, I will read them and, uh, you, you're very welcome to, to interrupt at any time or even unmute yourself and ask a question. I, I absolutely don't mind this, uh, quite the opposite. So, yes, um, there are multiple ways that a generative NFT can, can look, if we're talking about NFT now. So you can use code to generate a static image. You could use, like, generate a PNG, a JPEG, and mint that. That's, that's 
valid. That's uh, that's still generative art. The generation happens ahead of time, and then you mint the result of the generation. Some artists I know consider like Casey Reese is someone who considers that the the art if the art is code based like the art is alive and it's alive when the code is running and if you have just an image that captures the art then it's not at least for his work i don't think that he would be so dogmatic about the work of others but that um yeah that the art is is alive as code running on a machine and that any kind of image captured from it that is static is, is just documentation in a way I'm, i might be miss uh, like somewhat interpreting what he's saying uh, but but I remember that he was making a point like that. But uh, but yeah, it's totally valid if you want to really control the, the way that it looks. The safest way is to make a video or or, uh, or a static image out of your work. Um, but it can also be a real time application that runs in a browser, like every project on FX Hash typically. Um, so so yeah, you have generative NFTs. It's NFTs that contain art created using autonomous processes. And uh, again, art created using them doesn't mean that the process is happening in front of your eyes. It can have happened earlier. Um, and that includes what Tyler Hobbs calls long form generative art. And that's a, that's a whole a whole can of worms that uh, I'm, I'm going to just briefly touch up on, but you, you very, uh, I, I really recommend reading this article because it is foundational. Um, I don't like the term long form generative art. I've said it again and again, nothing against Tyler Hobbs uh, for, for coining it. But to me, it's, it's a little misleading in the sense that the, the long form aspect happens between iterations. So it's not time-based in this way, like when it says long form, the length is the length of the collection rather than the length of time that is typically what we associate with long form art in general, or a long form theater, I guess, there's, there's something called long form theater. Um, it, it, it refers to the time, but here long form is about the fact that you're creating a system that is going to generate not just one piece as if you were like using your code to generate a static image and then minting that image, but you're creating almost like an art creation machine. And this machine is going to function autonomously. And in the context of blockchain art and something like FX hash or art blocks or um, whatever other platform is doing long form generative art, um, I still need to find a better term, but for better or worse, that's kind of the, the canonical term. In this context of the blockchain, this, um, the way that this art machine functions is every time somebody puts money in the machine, they get a custom piece of art generated on the fly for them. Um, it's a little more complicated than that if you get into the technical aspect of it, and we, we will briefly, I promise. But essentially, uh, this is this is quite different from what happened before. And that's the main point of this article, actually, um, is that in the days before all these platform kind of um, enforced this mode of consumption of generative art, um, there was a, there were a lot more ways to think about curating your outputs. So you would produce a piece of code, and then that piece of code uh, would generate a bunch of outputs, and you would pick the outputs that you like best and um, show them to the world. Uh, you could try to sell them. That wasn't that easy back then, but I mean, it's still not easy today, but it's easier. Um, and uh, and yeah, so so the artist would retain some level of control over what they chose to show. Not necessarily what the machine spits out because autonomous process, right? But once this autonomous process is generating a thousand outputs, you could pick 10 out of those thousands and say, these are the ones that are up to my standards. Not so with FX hash, not so with art blocks. Why? Because you put your machine into this blockchain system or into IPFS uh, in most cases, but you put this machine online 
and then you can't touch it anymore. And every time somebody comes with their ETH or their TES or their SOL or whatever you want, and they buy an issue, an edition of it, the machine is going to do its thing. And then the artist has no control over what happens then. Um, you, you better, you better make sure that the, you have created a machine that outputs the kind of works that you want to see out in the world with your name on it. Um, and this happens very often, or it has happened very often that an artist mints a piece and then uh, people on FX hash start minting it or whatever platforms start minting it. And then there's duds. So there's, there might be, you know, you, you have created this machine and maybe once out of a hundred, it spits out an output that is just like pure black or just nothing, or it doesn't look like it belongs in the collection. And this is, um, this, this has been, uh, yeah, a, a big headache for a lot of artists. And, uh, there are a lot of considerations that you must have when you, when you make a collection like this, which is like, yeah, what, what is the range of possible expressions of that, those instructions and, um, how, how many editions do I want to make or allow people to mint, uh, so that they retain cohesion so they, they all belong in the same family here you see like this it's quite uh, fidenza has uh, has a lot of variation but they all kind of kind of belong uh, together in the same collection these these are clearly uh, purposefully picked as as some pretty extreme um, range of the parameter space but yeah you you want to craft your uh, i've said the word parameter space i should define it um, but yeah, you want to craft your parameter space in a way that it generates enough variety, but not so much variety that it, uh, it looks disjointed and, uh, also that each piece should be unique. So when somebody means something, they get, they don't get something that looks exactly like five other e editions in the collection, but yeah, parameter space, it is the, the degrees of control or the degrees of freedom uh, that your system has, say one parameter might be the color palette and that would be a discrete parameter. It could be, you have 10 different color palettes that could be, uh, that could happen. It could be, uh, the, in this case, we could think about the, the thickness of the lines. So you can have very thin lines, very fat lines. This is another parameter. Uh, how curvy is it? Like very curvy here, very smooth or very uh, angular. And this is another parameter and some parameters are continuous. Some parameters are, are discrete. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of those, but once you stack all these parameters together and you say like, those can be sort of manipulated, um, today there are ways that the collector can manipulate them themselves, uh, on FX hash in particular. But even if the collector is not the one tweaking them, if it's just like randomness decides which uh, where the sliders go, you still need to make sure that all kind of possible combination of parameters still look good or still look like something you want in your collection. So that's the parameter space. It, over time, once you make, you start making generative art, you, sh you will get an intuitive sense of what that means. And there are also ways that you can, um, you can control this by generating a whole dummy version of your collection and see, okay, no, this looks, this doesn't, doesn't look like I want, uh, I want, I want to tweak that. Actually, I could show you an example from a collection that, uh, that I published on FX hash. Let me, let me dig that up. I hadn't planned to show you that, but, uh, I think it's, it's relevant. So if we look at, uh, if we go to FX hash, uh, and I'll show you this. Okay. Uh, da -da -da, polar grid. So yeah, Polar Grid has, yeah, okay. So see, like one parameter is, is it more vertical, more horizontal. And uh, one of the big challenges with this was that I, um, okay, uh, yeah, there you go. So the, I'm, I'm very happy with the final result. This was minted for proof of people in London. Um, and yeah, this is, uh, and inspired by, uh, the color palettes of various movies uh, or various directors, actually, uh, movie directors. 
and they're also animated. So if you if you click on them, you'll see that they they animate. But yeah, early on, I was looking at the the possible outputs, and you'll see like there's a dot here. It's just pure black, or there's there's a little bit of color down there. That's not good. Some of them were really really saturated. I didn't like that. Uh, but yeah, some of them were completely dark. So those were like the first outputs. So I, I outputted 100 or 200 just to get a sense of the possible outputs. These were feeling too dull. So, you know, you keep, keep going back, you generate a bunch, you see what happens. Uh, in some cases, you can generate all of them for just one palette and see if you're happy with the variation. So yeah, those, those are ways that we can control the shape of the parameter space, so to speak, shape as an abstract concept. But uh, but yeah, this is this is the the kind of work that goes behind the scene, um, and this is for relatively simple collection. Uh, there, this there's not like a crazy amount of variation on this one, but it still uh, yeah, it still takes a lot of work if you want to make sure that it's it's just right. Uh, because yeah, again, you don't have control of what actually happened. Do you have questions so far? I'm going to move on to show you some actual examples of uh, of works that I consider interesting, especially from the early days. Uh, well, first from FX Hash and then from the early days of Hicketnung. Yes, I see some typing. I'm going to use that time to get a glug, a glug glug of water. I hope everything was <laughs> made sense. Um, these these are s slightly abstract concepts when you haven't made generative art yourself. Uh, I mean, I know some of you have, but um, yeah. Okay, okay, lots of typing. Any script to make a collection? I remember there was one, but left <laughs> on my old computer. Or oh, just to save output by input. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is. Um, I, in in my case, I used FX Snapshot. I know that uh, FX Hash has a has made a new tool for this. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll, uh, I'll. But the link is in the notes. I I'll, I was planning to show you um, to show you that later. But yeah, if you want to, uh, you can check that out. It's a. Uh, if you're a beginner, it might be a little a little complex to use, but um, uh, but yeah, if you already do some JavaScript, some or some Node, familiar with uh, Node.js, um, that sh uh, should be doable. <laughs> but if you have some, some yeah, if you if you're struggling, and you want to some help, uh, please do ask. Um, okay, so yeah, all right, everything good so far? Wonderful. Let's move on. So yeah, um, here are a few selected pieces from FX Hash. They don't represent the full scope of what exists on FX Hash. That would be impossible. We would need a whole week uh, without sleep or eating. But uh, just a few things that I selected um, to show you some kind of extreme cases of generative art in, in very different styles, just to give you a taste if, you, if you're not yet familiar with it. Um, so this one, Take Wing, is a, a quite, quite a popular collection from Melissa Viderecht. And we have, a, actually we have made a, a full breakdown of that piece uh, live on stream with Gorilla Sun. And if you're interested, I will uh, share, I will share the link. Uh, to that to that episode of the live stream, but yeah, it is it is a wonderful collection. It's very painterly, but something I per that's a, a personal personal taste of mine is when things look painterly, but they don't try to emulate paint in in a hyper realistic way. I find that usually less interesting. But you know, again, no accounting for taste. That's that's my my preferred thing um, but yeah it's, it's very evocative of of a painting without without necessarily trying to emulate every single aspect of a brush stroke but if you look closely which I'd, I definitely invite you to do and let's see if it's able to generate it uh, uh, okay come on come on all right oh, I thought it would go faster <laughs> 
Ah, okay. Uh, did crash. Huh, yeah. What? Is that possible? Um, all right. Yeah, I wanted to look, to take a closer look. But I mean, it, it, yeah, it worked there. Save image. Oh, I can. Hmm. Interesting. Oh, it's the first time I see that. Uh, okay, never mind. But <laughs> but if you look, so you can do it on your own. Um, if you if you look closely to to these compositions, there's there's lots of really interesting details like this texture that that could make you think a little bit of paper, but actually it's like a lot of squiggly lines overlapping with each other that that creates this uh, this this grain effect. It's not actually grain, and then there's also like some kind of warped texture in the back. All the brush strokes are actually based on. Uh, that's that's a technical term, but for those of you who know that that will be interesting. It's based on shaders, so so it it's generating each brush stroke as its own kind of generative piece, and then pasting it on the on on the canvas. Oh yeah, thank you for the screenshot. So so yeah, if you if you look at the uh, let me see. Yeah, if you if you look closely, yeah, you'll see those those squiggly lines that that add a little bit of texture. They they also help blend everything together. There's a trend in generative art that where people love like paper textures and grain because it 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 makes things look more analog. But there's another good reason for it is also that it yeah it really unites everything when you have different kind of. Um, kind of styles of of objects and shapes in your in your piece having some kind of texture blending everything together it, it really helps unite the aesthetic the thing aesthetically and that's not just a generative principle it's a, a design principle aesthetic principle um, but you don't have to use just like fake grain or real grain for that matter or um, or use paper textures or simulated paper textures, you can also use a different kind of grain. And that's something that Melissa did there. And I, I love I love this piece for that reason, uh, among others. So yeah. And then, uh, okay, I'm gonna close this because it's <laughs> breaking my, my uh, browser. But yeah, so, and here you can see those brush strokes that, that are following, uh, that are following a, a f like a flow field that is a, that's another technical term, but um, yeah, it's essentially like uh, a directional field, a field of direction, a map of directions, like little arrows that define which direction something could, should go based on some noise, um, like 2D noise texture. And that's, uh, that's, that's uh, very similar to Fidenza, actually. Fidenza is also a flow field. And uh, that's a that's a very popular technique in generative art uh, flow fields. Once you discover flow fields, it's not that hard to make, and and it 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 looks great. Um, so yeah, have fun with flow fields. But uh, but yeah, it's it's interesting usually to take these foundational techniques and apply them by blending them with other things rather than making like just the thing out of the can. Um, I think those those techniques typically. Uh, yeah, they, they should be used sparingly. They, they, they end up tasting like, uh, you know, like store boat spice mix kind of thing. <laughs> um, if you, if you, if you don't use them with intent and, and you should always use techniques with intent. All right. So that was take wing. Um, then we have another favorite of mine, latent garden by pixel filler. And this one is quite fascinating for a different reason. It is, so yeah, you have these different flower bouquets and what's, uh, yeah, it is, it is very cool. And it has, yeah, there's, there's a couple of reasons why I love this piece. The first one, and that's a, a, yeah, a personal pet peeve of mine. It looks great full screen. And that's not the case of every collection on FX hash, unfortunately. But yeah, it adapts uh, perfectly to full screen, as you can see. Um, the other thing is, um, 
it's actually O type. That's those are ASCII characters, and so yeah, you can you can you can select them, which is really funny. Um, and they are they're like ASCII characters that are colored, very elegant, very beautiful. Gives it a completely unique aesthetic. And the last reason, and maybe some of you noticed that when you first open it, it says loading model. This is actually an adversarial, uh, a generative adversarial network. So it is AI generated imagery in the browser. And what's super clever about it is that this pixelated aesthetic is not just there for no reason. It's because this model can only in the browser, you can only generate rather small images. So because of this, it the, the pixel filler didn't just say like, well, okay, then I guess it's pixelated and, and leave it at that, but use this trick of uh, using ASCII character to bring back some level of detail and a unique aesthetic that, um, yeah, it wouldn't look quite as nice if it was just like a pixelated image uh, generated out of the model. So, so yeah, I, I love this uh, collection. I think this artist didn't really get the the level of recognition that uh, that they deserve. Uh, but yeah, they continue to make to make more stuff, and some of it I, I really love uh, as well. There's like a collection of of um, butterflies, and yeah, some more abstract stuff uh, later. I wonder if how yeah, this is from November last year. Um, yeah, they they were struggling a little bit to get to get catch the eye of collectors and that's the case for a lot of of artists unfortunately and i you know i have to say there's a there's an element of luck we have i'm not going to talk about market or stuff like that i'm sure you have tons of uh tons of people talking about this uh ask callo about it on on uh, this week so that you are going to talk to callo as well but uh and he knows a lot more about market than i do but yeah, um, I see a, a question in the chat. Is it possible to see the code for these projects on FX Hash? Uh, I feel a complete disconnect from the work and what it could would take to actually make the work. Yeah, we'll get we'll get to this, but it's an excellent question, and I'm glad you asked it. Uh, you can indeed do that if you go if you open the and I don't know about this one particularly uh, specifically, but if you so if you open the work like full screen by clicking on the open button. So it opens in a new tab and, and it's as if like the work is rendering as a, a web page. That's, that's what it is. When you see it here, it's inside what's called an iframe. And that's essentially a window inside of the website that renders another website. So inception websites, web set, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but if you if you're on there and you press uh, I think it's F12 yeah if you press F12 on your keyboard or control shift I on uh, on Windows and command uh, is it command alt I on on Mac anyway um, you can find it in the options as well you can open the what's called the dev tools and here we have our console and we can also click on sources. And if we go to sources, we'll see that we have the code that generates the piece. And here it's, uh, it says, yeah, bundle.js. There's a lot of stuff. So this is not particularly readable. And not all of the, not all of the works that we're, we're going to look at is going to have their code in a, in a very readable format. Some of them do. I think take wing was plain like uh, plain text readable uh, at least we uh, or maybe we had to ask melissa for the code but I, I think if i remember correctly oh yeah but it wasn't rendering so it wasn't loading for some reason that's annoying uh, but yeah if you do this on some collections at least uh, i'll try to show you an example of that uh, later so it doesn't work with latent garden but yeah you you can do it and i i 100 recommend that you do um, let's see, uh, let me see. I think, I think I know some, um, collection. I think I know of some that you can actually, you can actually look at, uh, boom, 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 boom. um, because some artists, when they publish their work, uh, either deliberately or because they use a template, the work, the code is going to get sort of smushed. Uh, to to load faster, but that also means it's not readable. 
um, this, uh, using something uh, typically using something called Webpack. And what Webpack is doing is it's packing your code by making it tiny, uh, but unfortunately also making it unreadable by human eyes. So uh, yeah, let me see. Uh, I remember some that uh, maybe Quaderno is readable. But yeah, you can try every time and and see if you find it. Yeah, bundle JS, main JS. Yeah, there you go. This one, this one is. So this is Quaderno by Diego Pintos. Uh, it's also a personal favorite. And uh, yeah, here I go into the Dev Tools sources, click on main JS, and there you'll see that I have uh, I have actually plain text code. That, that I can read. It even has uh, comments here. So yeah, licensed, um, distant point line from, okay, there's some some uh, credits to some code that uh, Diego used from somebody else apparently. And yeah, function setup. So you see it's p5.js. We have p5.js that is included there, p5.min.js. And yeah, we can just go and read it. And that's one of the great things about uh, generative art running in a browser a code-based art running in the browser in general is that typically you can go and read the code. Uh, it is Again, it's not always going to be in a format that you can read. Also, it takes a little bit of time to read some, the code written by somebody else. They have they might have a different style. Uh, they may or may not include comments to explain what's going on. And so it's kind of on you to go and try to understand it. Some artists are, yeah, are writing more readable codes than uh, code than others. So if you're a beginner, it might be a little tricky, but it I think it's educational to still like go and try, you know, try to find what I typically try to do. I, I'm not gonna understand everything that happens in there, but one thing I like to do is try to find one thing you understand. Just one. You know, look for one line that that you sort of get what's going on. And that's that's already good. You learn something from it. Just one. Just one thing. Um, here we see random point a b and and yeah it creates a vector that means like uh, yeah the position in 2d space and so I, I guess it's creating a random point a and b maybe that's the range like uh, how how large do you want to so yeah I'm not sure but yeah looks like it's probably picking a random point in 2d space um, and then yeah orthogonal projection I have no idea what that does. But uh, but yeah, you can you can go and try to find that one thing. Here we see oh yeah, keep rest, save canvas. So it's yeah, this one I understand. So if I press S, it should save yeah an image and uh, give it this title and some hash. Um, yeah, it's using the hash uh, the FX hash. So yeah, you can save it. Yeah, so we understood one thing. That's good, right? Um, so I hope that answered your question. If you have bundle.js, there are libraries plus code, so it's extremely hard to read. Yeah, yeah, if you see bundle.js, it's probably not gonna be readable. Um, but if you see main.js or sketch.js, uh, there's, there's a chance that it's p5.js and that you will be able to read it, um, though that's not a guarantee. It's a lot of stuff. Yeah, I mean, and that wasn't even the long one. <laughs> There's some, I mean, if Zankan shows you his uh, the the code of his finished pieces, it's it's incredibly long and it's lots of different folders. Uh, yeah, I'll I'll share some some of the episodes of FX Review that we did with with uh, with Ahmad Gorilla San because we really go deep into like okay, what is what is going into this? Um, actually, you you should probably check out yeah gorilla sun's uh, article on and that's Sarkissian's piece that we that we analyzed when I mean, he analyzed and then we did the episode together i relied a lot on his his work uh for that one in particular um oh, oh, that's too much he's publishing so many articles tutorials feature guide making off newsletter Okay, I'm not sure where. It's too much, too much, too much. Okay, well, I'll I'll find it for you. Maybe we should ask him to show us his code and run through it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's uh, so Zankan is. I mean, you'll see, you'll see. He's 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 uh, he's got a very very unique approach. He doesn't really do it the same as as most people. He's building his own tool in a in a different way. But yeah, it's very interesting. You'll see that. Um, go, son. 
uh, sage brush. Yeah, that was the, yeah, there you go. So this, this article is really good and it's, it's a full breakdown of how this collection, I love not Sarkisian's work and this collection from, uh, from Nat, um, is, uh, yeah, is is creating these these beautiful, super painterly, uh, impressionistic landscapes from California. It's it's amazing. Yeah, I don't want to spoil it. You should check it out. It's absolutely incredible what goes into into these. Um, it's, it's got a, a mastery of light and um, yeah, it, it's phenomenal work. Okay, there's, there's so much great work and so little time to talk about it. Um, Moving on, yeah, I need to I need to move on if we want to look a little bit at how you make these things. I have way more stuff I want to talk about than time to talk about it, but I'm glad you have questions and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's good, it's good. I'm always uh, available if you if you want to ask more questions or you can come to my Discord and ask, and people are uh, lovely there as well and always willing to help. Um, Chrysalis by, I'm not even sure, how, Chrysalis, how do you pronounce this? But uh, Monotower and Arceliath. Arceliath is one of my favorite uh, artists, period. Absolutely amazing uh, technical mastery, but also aesthetic. And this is, this is like showing off technically. It's just, it's not even funny. Uh, it's, it's just incredible technical mastery. Um, using using shaders, um, so shaders are programs. I mentioned the word shaders before. I didn't explain what they were, what they are. But if you play Minecraft or if you're into ga video games, you might have heard the word shader in that context. It's they are like little programs that run on your graphics cards, and that gives them the ability to be very um, very efficient and do like uh, kind of visual effects that would be very difficult to do on the pro the microprocessor of the, the CPU of the computer. Um, so we have the, the GPU, graphical processing unit, that, uh, that lets you do operations on individual pixels very fast. And so, yeah, you can do some pretty incredible things with it. And uh, so, yeah, this, uh, this one is, uh, Chrysalis is, is just, just incredible, but very technical as well. So that's not everybody's cup of tea. And we'll get to, to that in a second. Uh, but yeah, like, look at that. Just phenomenal stuff. And interactive, right? Again, if you have any questions, but I know you know you've, you've done it before. You, you're asking. You're good. You're, you're doing great. So, so yeah, this is just beautiful, beautiful work. And yeah, and see, it renders this 3D in the browser. Is it GLB? No, no, no. It's... it's um, so GLB is a 3D model, like a format where you can upload a 3D model. This is this is live rendering in the browser uh, with light simulation and uh, fractals and smoke simulation and everything just rendered in the browser dynamically. There is no model. There's no 3D model, um, and and you couldn't have you couldn't really have GLB on FX Hash uh, because imagine you would need to have like a different model for each one. Uh, that doesn't, yeah, that wouldn't even work. Like uh, you can't, you can't do that. But uh, well, I guess you could combine different GLBs, but that would be, yeah, that you wouldn't get that that level of of um, of quality with it. So yeah, no, it's it's. Uh, I believe it's ray tracing. Uh, there's not really an explanation there. Um, but yeah, there's an article. I think there was an article like a fixed text to explain it. No, it's not there. Um, but, or maybe it is at the top, let me see. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, best of FX hash, uh, shaders for generative art. No, that's not it. Okay, FX review. Uh, yeah, anyway. So, and finally, something completely different. Uh, another artist who I'm, uh, yeah, I, I'm a big fan. Uh, Chrysalis reduced stream FPS on my PC to like three. <laughs> Beautiful though. Yeah, when I, I when I was showing it on uh, live on on Twitch, it was like completely destroying the live stream because my my GPU was a hundred percent dedicated to trying to render those pixels. Um, 
it's uh I, and and maybe that was the case uh with with the with the live right now as well i don't know i hope not i hope you could still still see me um and see something but yeah guillaume cornet is uh is fantastic artist illustrator and this is a, a collab with uh frostbitten uh frost <laughs> why am i saying it with a german accent frostbitten uh and yeah um road trip so so we have different landscapes it's all based on pngs so each of those uh, of those elements that you see move are are hand drawn and then combine in a kind of collage so i, I remember some people last last week were were talking about oops, sorry about being uh, being really into collage so i i'm typically not the like the biggest fan of what I see as like PNG composition on FX hash. I've seen some good ones, but usually it ends up not having as as much vari variety because you're limited to the to the those PNG elements that you put in, and that ends up being a bit repetitive to my taste. Uh, not all of them. There's some really people doing really clever stuff with it. Beautiful, especially when you start overlaying stuff and rotation and everything. But um, but yeah, this is this is really nice because it's like you have all your elements and then you make it generative by by the way you combine them and you add the animation. It's it's really fun. And Guillaume Cornet is a super play, super playful artist. Uh, I, I I love everything that that Guillaume is making. He's making these like crazy Where's Waldo style, the huge composition of entire cities and forests with little characters going around. There's lots of Easter eggs. Um, I think this one in particular, like, or maybe it was uh, Gas City. Uh, let me see. But yeah, there's there's two two collections on FX Hash from Guillaume, and um, yeah, the Gal, Gal City is also also super fun. And yeah, they're like I rem <laughs> yeah, see a little bit of of uh, of flair. Oh, that's not the button I wanted to press. Yeah, there's like some 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 showmanship going on. Um, but yeah, I know that this one in particular, there are some some time based events, and that's something you can do if you're running in a browser. You can check the date, and you can say like, oh, it's Halloween, so let's put a pumpkin somewhere or something. So um, yeah, uh, this is super fun, and this is something you can you can you can do you can do something like this. Uh, let me see if I if the code is visible on this one. Uh, no, it's bundled, but uh, yeah, no, it's not gonna be readable, not at all. But yeah, uh, those are like there's there's a lot of. There's a lot of work that goes into them, but if you break it down, technically it's not it's not very complicated. So it's complicated, but not not very. Uh, yeah, thanks for the link. So yeah, Guillaume Cornet is uh, is is a wonderful illustrator, and uh, that's that's another thing as well. Like you know, you don't have to be a coder yourself to make a generative collection. You can also find um, generative artists you like who's more technically proficient than you, uh, it helps if you're able to communicate with them, right? You need to understand a little bit what the, you know, maybe now you know what a parameter space is that that would help you communicate with them. But yeah, you can do a collab. Uh, yeah. So those were some things from FX hash. Um, do we have do we have questions? How are we doing on time? So we started an hour ago, something like this. We have another another hour, I believe. Let me see. Do we need a little brain break for people? Yeah, another hour. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah, ask any questions you have. I'm gonna let's see if I find that uh, that timeline of generative art. Mm, no, I don't see it. Maybe, maybe, maybe the random. Mm. 
Ah, yeah, there you go. But is there a link? No, it's still just a thread. Yeah, that's but that's super cool. So that's something that Monk was talking about in the uh, Waiting to be Signed podcast. Like they really go back, like even before computers, uh, to the origins of generative art. And if you if you look back, also a lot of artists, like computer artists who were using code early on, like Vera Molnar, they were, or Manfred Moore, they were very much influenced by abstract art as well uh, of the time or like the time came before. And they saw computers as a way to, to do some aesthetic exploration. Uh, all right. So yeah, if we don't have any questions, I'll, uh, I'll move on. I will move on. So where did this start? So I'm not going to go back to the 50s or before to tell you about the origins of computer art. Uh, we don't have time for that. But I'm going to go back to the origins of generative art on Tezos. And in particular, uh, maybe not generative art in general, in the general sense, as I mentioned, with uh, like minting an image or minting a video, but minting a program, a code that runs um, not necessarily on chain. That's also another distinction that can be important. Um, uh, putting anything on the blockchain, I don't want to get too deep into that, but putting anything, any data on the blockchain is expensive and limited because you only have so much space you have in the metadata to put code. Um, you can do it, and some platforms do it. I'm less familiar with them, if I'm being honest, but I know that some platforms uh, are what you call on-chain, and so the code is there, and that means that it is uh, preserved. Uh, if As long as the chain exists, the code exists, and it can be interpreted. Maybe you need to have libraries on top, like you could say, like, okay, this is my sketch, uh, but you need P5.js. Uh, you're go not going to put P5.js on the chain, though maybe somebody, I'm, I'm sure somebody did that, but that would be quite expensive. Um, but yeah, you you can do that on chain, or you can have the work be on IPFS or something similar to IPFS. Um, I, I believe you get uh, you get some some um, uh, you you get some education in that at VCA, uh, but so I don't need to really talk too much about this. But yeah, typically uh, the work in the case of generative NFTs, the code is stored on IPFS, and then just the metadata of the NFT is on chain, uh, with some exceptions. But yeah, I'm going to talk about these these early days of Hicketnung. And this here is, is a magic trick. So this is a piece by Macchio135, Lionel Radisson. And it was called The Magician because at the time where it was published uh, on, let me see what was the date, on March 19th, 2021, uh, Hicket opened. Hicket Nunc was the, the first real NFT marketplace on Tezos. And it opened on March 1st, 2021. On March 19th, Macchio135 published this piece. Uh, though actually, it might even be the second issue, the second version. Yeah, the updated version. So let me see. No, no, no. no. Let's, let's get our history right. So this was the fixed version because the original one's a little broken. So the original one was published uh, on March 14th. All right. So... So that's two weeks into the existence of Hicketnung. What's particularly striking about it, and it might not uh, strike you right now, uh, because it, it doesn't look like much. It's like, okay, I can click to pose and play it. You mean it's interactive? But wait a second, Hicketnung doesn't support interactive NFTs. You're not, you're not allowed to mint interactive things on Hicketnung. You can only mint images uh and text and pdf uh you can mint vector graphics but you're not supposed to be able to mint an interactive nft also you can only mint images and then on the feed you're gonna see uh you're gonna see the image that you minted but this one when you looked on the feed you would see just a black square and when you open it it looked different that was not supposed to be possible and that's the magic trick <laughs> the magic trick was this is 
this is vector graphics. This is uh, what's called an SVG. And an SVG file is, um, it's, uh, it, it, if you use the Illustrator or any kind of uh, SVG, like any kind of vector graphics program, it allows to make files that scale at any dimension because uh, the description of the graphics is entirely mathematical. It's a mathematical representation. If you have a triangle, you just have the coordinates of the triangle and that's it. But one thing that many people didn't realize, me included, is that an SVG is actually, the SVG format is more, more involved than, than just that. What the SVG format can do is you can actually embed HTML in an SVG. You can embed HTML and you can embed JavaScript in an SVG. And so what Lionel found out is that he could embed interactive elements uh, using JavaScript inside of an SVG and modify the shape of the SVG dynamically. So he did that, uh, minted it on Hiketnunk, and it didn't work. It didn't work because Hiketnunk didn't allow the iframe uh, to execute JavaScript code. So uh, Lionel was a bit bummed down and he wrote to Andre Venancio, who was uh, one of the little helpers of Raphael Lima, the creator of, of Hiketnunk. At the time, Andre was, uh, was helping with some of the development of Hiketnunk. He, he then moved on together with somebody called Vector to build Versum, which is uh, another another platform which borrowed a lot of ideas, but uh, aesthetically went a very different direction than uh, than what Ikenthnook was. And yeah, so Lionel asked Andre, hey, uh, do you think you could fix that so, so this works? And so they did. And they just turned off the sandbox uh, feature that said no JavaScript. And so suddenly you could upload an SVG with some JavaScript code inside of it that would make an interactive NFT or generative NFT. So not a collection like on FX hash, just a single piece, but you could have your code run on online. And at the time, as far as I'm aware, and I'm still waiting for somebody to, to give me like an earlier, an earlier, um, like some prior art for this, but at the time, I'm not aware of another platform on any chain that was supporting minting interactive pieces like minting code on on a on a marketplace on an NFT marketplace. I, I'm sure like it's possible there was there was something, especially because I wasn't really looking at Ethereum at the time. So maybe on Ethereum some of that already existed. I'm not sure exactly how art blocks worked or if it was already like doing that at the time. Um, but certainly on Tezos, that was the first. That was the first one, and it wasn't even supposed to be possible, which I, I, I genuinely, genuinely love. And when The Magician came out, some of us took notice uh, who were already there uh, in the early, like the first few weeks of Hicketon opening, and we got really excited. Like a lot of artists got really excited about this. And some people found out, okay, so I can add uh, P5.js, like embed P5.js inside of an SVG, and then I have my whole P5.js stuff. Um, and later on, when when the people who were working on Hiketnung saw that, uh, yeah, that that was becoming a thing, uh, they they actually allowed minting, like actually minting a zip file with uh, with with your interactive code inside. But this is the the foundational event that. Um, that made FX hash happen as well. Uh, I mean, Cyphered, who created FX hash, was on Hiketnunk. Uh, Andre, who was on like helping with development of Hiketnunk, went on to do Versum. Um, uh, Marching Square, who went on to make Object.com, was on Hiketnunk. And uh, and we were all like uh, generative artists, computer artists, code, creative coders who, who were making work before and who suddenly saw an opportunity for our work to live online and be uh, have some commercial success or you know be able to, to have collectors collect the actual work that we're making, which is the code running, I mean, not always in a browser, but in this case, in a browser. So th this is why I really want to insist on this moment because this piece 
or actually the the, <laughs> the first one, which because uh because this was completely new the first one's broken so then uh lionel made the second one when he could actually debug it and see how it would look on the on the platform so this is this is like the second one uh but uh but yeah i still have a fondness for the the, the first one he was telling people like yeah if you burn the first one i'll give you the second one but i i didn't burn mine i really wanted to keep it uh because it's such a historical piece even if it's broken right so that's yeah, that's that's the start. That's where it starts. Um, I'm gonna show you some other pieces. They they don't have like the same historical significance, but this is um, but but they are also like I'm showing you different interactive pieces just to to show you what it means for an artwork to run inside of a browser versus um, versus like capturing an image and minting that. So this is a piece uh, by Leander Herzog called Antenna. It was minted on the 1st of April, 2021. So that's also early days by uh, by Tezo standards. Um, what I love about it is it's it's responsive. So it's animated and it's generating this animation real, real time. And so what you see is that you can have this animation look, it looks good in the square format. It looks great in this rectangular format, and it, it adapts to any dimensions, keeps uh, some uh, smart ma margins around it, and it kind of hurts your eyes if you look at it too long, but it is, um, yeah, it is responsive. And that's something you couldn't do if, with a video. Like you could make a video of this, but then it wouldn't look good on the square format. Or you can make a video of the square format, but then if you try to make it full screen, it wouldn't look good. And the other aspect of it is that uh, potentially, I'm not sure about, like this exact one, how it works, but you can have something that generates new animations over time and never loops. So that's also an aspect of having code-based work in the browser that is unique to this format is that you can have these, these endless, endless formats and, um, yeah, an, an artwork that lives forever. Um, Edge Sinuosity by Saskia. Also interactive in a different way. I think this one, if you press R, yeah, it just like this is very like I'm showing you things that are interactive in a very <laughs> minimal way. So we saw the first the first piece, the first code base like um, live code piece. The magician was interactive in the sense that you could pose and play the animation. So very very minimal, but still interactive. Um, the piece by Leander before it's interactive in the sense that it responds to the space. And this one is interactive by the fact that if you press the letter R, uh, you can get a variation of it. So this is already going like almost long form, right? It's uh, you you have endless variations, even though the palette is the same. But uh, but yeah, Saskia. Amazing artist, by the way, check out Saskia's work. She's been doing a daily sketch for, I believe, probably eight years by now. <laughs> it's just, uh, she's, she's incredible and she's making beautiful work. Yeah. One of these each, each day, like every, did I say week? I think, I think I might have said week. So yeah, one piece every day. And, uh, and she's been doing that for for years. They're not all on this page, but, uh, but you can check out Saskia online and, and find her, her work. Um, that's dedication. Uh, piece by Gallo, which I love as well. That includes some, uh, yeah. So let me put it full screen. So if you don't interact with it, nothing happens, but if you do, we have fluid simulation. It's a little bit reminding also of the piece we looked at before from Pixel Filler with this uh, this grid uh, of uh, of pixel with a very strong style uh, like this. Uh, this is using dithering. This is a kind of kind of way to to add more colors or more uh, gradients to something that uses a very very narrow color palette. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, also uh, so this one's called Liquid Pixels. Uh, number six, and it was minted on the 30th of May, 2021. Uh, things are a little crazy right now. So this one, wait, ah, okay, I'll put it full screen. Zoom out, okay, yeah, it was too zoomed in. Yeah, the, the, I 
feel like the noise was looking better at some point and and it got <laughs> it got kind of broken or maybe it's just because i'm i'm running a full 4k screen but uh yeah this is this is a wonderful piece uh, conceptually it existed before like i i remember it from before hiketnung uh, but then it got minted on hiketnung and it's uh it's ai like kind of ai based or some some kind of i don't know if it's a language model and it was before chat gpt and stuff like that but uh it's two uh, two virtual people who are stuck in an endless scheduling loop trying to find a time to meet but it never works out <laughs> and uh yeah we live in the society right so yeah this is uh this uh, it's a great piece it didn't mean no no shade of course it was just just a joke but i i absolutely love this piece uh yeah things are a little crazy right now uh yeah it's using gpt3 i never really looked into the code to see if it's actually running in the how, how does it work i don't know i don't know but uh but yeah this one is was minted on 19th of april 2021 it is by jy and uh, do we have a link? I don't know. Geneva AI artist and writer. Yeah, I don't know. At some at some point, I think like uh, social media links got lost in the source. Um, but yeah, wonderful piece. In a completely different style, Hugh Messi, an artist from New York, uh, who I, I absolutely love. And this is an interactive piece. But it's uh it's a little different oh yeah see this this one isn't centered it's not centered here but yeah so if i click and i click again and i click again it's gonna build a little plane a little paper plane and this is not like uh this is not a filter an effect or like a photoshop anything and now if i move my mouse left and right i can make the plane rotate this is actually stitched on felt with a with a machine uh, based on a processing sketch. So Hugh is is writing code that generates uh, these visuals and stitching patterns, and then it stitches them on and, and oh, not endless, but on large amounts of felt and photographs it, and then it it turns it in like he turns it into animations typically but this one was a more experimental one that was interactive most of his work end up ends up being just a, a video loop but this one this early one was interactive i'm not sure that if you makes anything interactive anymore um, at least i haven't noticed it recently but yeah another artist to to look at uh, his his stuff especially his his recent stuff is just mind-blowing he went into oh yeah there we go oh are those recent uh date doesn't appear here but but yeah he's a fantastic artist uh, yeah this one is this one's just brilliant oh, there's also audio for it yeah i started adding color and everything it's just mind-blowing anyway i'm getting a little on a, a little bit of a tangent that never happens to me uh and so yeah uh where are we broken automaton this one is from Tomb. Not sure if Tomb is still active today. I haven't recently been aware of anything that she made, but uh, yeah, uh, those are using uh, a technique called the cellular automaton. It's um, it's used to create like this something you may maybe have heard of Conway's Game of Life, which is sort of the the most famous cellular automaton. And cellular automata, plural, is a category of, of algorithms, I guess, um, where each pixel has some sort of knowledge of the pixel surrounding it, and it changes its state based on that, and that creates emergent patterns. And I, I really like the, the cellular automata, the like, broken cellular automata that, uh, that Tomb was making back then. There's a, there's a bunch of them. Uh, yeah, they're, they're really lovely. And they're actually running in the browser. So those are not, or I think they are. I think they are. I didn't, <laughs> I don't, it's been a while since I actually looked at those. What is it? Uh, yeah, application. It is an application. So if I run it and I try to look at, I try to look at it. 
Hmm. Yeah, not sure. Might have to reload it to see it. Anyway. Boop. Okay. So this. Um, and then there was stuff that you could do on Hiketnunk that was uh, very interesting. And you can still do this on Teya. Now, I'm, I'm showing you this stuff on Teya because Teya sort of continued the project of Hiketnunk, but as a community driven initiative. Um, under a, a DAO now, which is uh, which is being constituted at the moment. That's been a lot of work for the people involved. So yeah, big big um, shout out to to the whole uh, to the whole team at Teya. But yeah, this is a this is a piece of mine, and uh, it's using a specific trick that you could do on Hiketnung and you can still do on on Teya. Which is that you can be aware, or you can make your your sketch, your your code aware of who's looking at it. So when you're logged in, when you you're synced, you synced your wallet with with the Teya website. Um, the website will pass into into the iframe. It will pass your your wallet I address as a string, as a string of characters to the code. And so what you can do is you can make it look different for each person looking at it. And in this way, it is a little bit of like a, um, a long form, a long form piece. In this case, it wasn't like super advanced. I was just, I think I'm just showing a different palette depending on, on who's looking at it. So here I'm, I'm logged in, but let me like, if I open it in a incognito, sorry, incognito window, it's going to look different. So it's a different palette. So that was another kind of magic trick that you could that you could do. Um, there's there's more that you could do, and that's uh, actually got a little lost. Uh, this one by Leah was using microphone input. I can't show it to you because uh, my microphone's going to you, but uh, but yeah, it would generate different patterns based on microphone input. Uh, you could also use camera input. Actually, I haven't seen many people use that. At the time, and uh, Teya still supports all of those, all of this stuff. Um, but now we're getting into some, uh, yeah, some a little bit crazier stuff with New Yellow. Um, and there were a few people exploring, and it's, it's not going to look like much. You're not gonna, you're not going to be able to tell what's going on. But this one, what's super fun about it is that there was four of them. Each of them was a different room. It's called In the Rooms. And this one's the the desk working. It's the it's the office, but there was also the kitchen, living room, and the bedroom. And if you collected, say you collect the desk, and then you you also collect the bedroom, then there would be a, a different object, like an extra object appears in the illustration based on the fact that you collected the the other the other piece from the collection, and that's possible because um, because Hiketnunk and Altea supports. Um, supports call to third-party APIs, which is kind of risky in the sense that if this API dies, then the piece is not working anymore. This one, um, this one, I, I don't know actually if the API part still works, but it, it's smartly designed in a way that it doesn't it doesn't break uh, it doesn't break even if the API doesn't work anymore. Let me see if we get uh, enable audio context. Yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, so it does, it's not complaining. So maybe it's, yeah, it looks like it might be using an API that still works. Um, and yeah, it has, it has audio as well. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure if you can, no, you probably can't hear it. Even if I'm sharing my screen, I don't think the audio goes through, but yeah, you know, here, like click, click. Um, yeah, that's, that's actually a really fun interaction. I think I, I really like that. Um, that's, that's kind of clever that you get the, the light turns on and off and you get the whole light being superimposed uh, as highlights on objects. And there's, there's actually two lights that you can turn on and off in the scene. But yeah, this, uh, for, for such a simple illustration, there's a lot of uh, complexity hidden in it. And I, I like to show this because I know that some of you are not coders, uh, maybe you're illustrators, maybe you're, you're painters, or artists using traditional media. And I, I just want to show you that you know it doesn't have to be uh, either or. You can also uh, mix media and and use code in clever ways in your in your art, even if you're using traditional media. Um, okay, there's there are a lot of things I wanted to show. This is a lot more 
Uh, this is yeah okay. We're getting into the mega nerd, uh, <laughs> the mega nerdy stuff. But I, I still want to show it. Okay, I'm I'm gonna try to go a bit faster so we can we can talk about the the making. But yeah, this is a uh, this is important. Um, so this one is not gonna work. This one's broken. This one is using an API that has been deprecated since. So you can see here API better call dev uh, fail to load resource 404. Uh, that's because the Better call dev API API has been um, has been deprecated. Uh, in the meantime, um, I think they were yeah you, can, you can't find it. Uh, but this was a really clever piece. So this is for for the coders amongst uh, amongst you. <laughs> Nerd is good. <laughs> so uh, this is absolutely mind blowing, and it's a collection of pieces called the meta instructions. I hope that somebody, or that even Yazid who made them, Yazid got really successful with other collections later that were uh, less experimental. Uh, that's not a moral judgment, by the way, just a, a statement of fact. But these very early experimental pieces for me were were uh, really interesting. And he wasn't the, the only one doing it. Mario Klingemann also very early on started uh, doing some really fun, interesting uh, experimental stuff. New Yellow also, and some other people. I know that uh, that uh, Ahmad uh, Gorilla Sun is gonna is researching the topic of dynamic NFTs to 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 write an article about it. So I'm really looking forward to this um but yeah this is sort of a little bit of a forgotten history of uh of nfts on tezos and nfts in general and generative art or computer art code art those dynamic nfts um and the experimental pieces on hiketnung but meta instructions what it's doing or what it was doing and it's failing to do now <laughs> fetching instructions you can see it's trying but it's, it's uh, sadly dead um is that the description of the piece, the metadata, contains code, right? It contains the code. And what the code is doing in the piece, if I look at the code, uh, let me see if I can, uh, sources, so I should be able to, well, should be able to, to see it. It's, uh, it's trying to find its own code into the description somewhere. So I'm not sure where it is. Um, uh, should, is that actually, am I actually looking at the code of the piece or something else? I'm not sure, uh, possibly not. Let me see if I can find it. But yeah, it's trying to find, to find its own code, to, to read it and, and then to evaluate it and, and execute it sad when code breaks yeah i mean in in this case the code breaks because the api is is offline it doesn't doesn't exist anymore but yeah uh, and it would produce it would produce this this beautiful pattern that you can still see in the thumbnail um and Yazid ha at the time made a lot of other pieces that were going in in similar direction that was that was really fun stuff uh, like you could buy a black and white yeah, here you can see meta instructions, like other, there were other meta instructions that would actually animate, like read the code and then animate it. So these, these are just GIF, like GIF animations that, uh, well, they document the work somehow, but they're not the actual work. Um, and yeah, you had these, these black and white pieces that you could collect. And then if you collect it, yes, yeah, so this one, for example, that this is a black and white piece. Uh, but it's not. So if you collected color swatches separately from Yazid, then went back to look at your collected black and white piece, it would start having the color swatches that you also collected separately. So yeah, all really experimental, really uh, prone to breaking, <laughs> not robust, but such such wonderful, wonderful work. Um, and I hope that we recover some of those capabilities in the future. Pretty fun to see this work of his. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, and uh, yeah. So this uh, yeah, there's more of those. I think this is also yeah, this is also from Yazid. And the last one of this type, um, recursive twins by Andreas Hau, is is a fantastic piece. 
and and it's not just one piece it's two separate pieces i'm going to try to show you how they look um so if i load both of them you'll see that what's happening there's there's one that is like a thousand editions and the other one is a it was a one one and they're actually looking each other up and loading each other in an infinite loop it's actually it continues forever <laughs> You can't see it because it becomes too small, but they are still kind of looking up each other. And so if one loads the other and the other loads the other, then it, it creates this, this infinite loop where they look at each other. And it was also kind of an experiment, I think, about value uh, where Andreas wanted to see like, yeah, what happens if you have like two very similar pieces, but one is, a, is unique and the other is like a thousand editions. Um, I never really asked him like what he got out of the experiment. Like, is, uh, is there any any conclusions that he came to? But uh, but yeah, it was. Uh, we were all at at that point. Uh, the the idea of selling our work was also something that was kind of new, and and the idea of a market for generative art. I think coming to a market as people who are used to thinking in procedural like computational ways uh, for us it was a whole like interesting playground of a, a new system that we could try to hack and break and 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 play with in in interesting ways a lot of us were were looking at these questions of market dynamics from a a, a creative experimental perspective which i think is still a good way to approach it uh, playfully not not like trying to optimize everything but just like oh how can we play with those market dynamics um yeah. All right. And uh, this is a piece by me. <laughs> that is, uh, yeah. Um, and one thing I used to, I used to do at that point was, uh, because you, you may not even notice that this is a code based piece that has like some noise added on top of it to make it look more like, like cinema uh, from the 1920s which is a strong in inspiration for that series. But at that point, what I would was doing is I was including uh, a button that would let you look at the code for the work. So it's loading loading the code from the work, not by looking it on the blockchain and so on, like as it was doing, just uh, the, the, the piece itself would display its own code. And yeah, I was... I was thinking a lot about this at the time, like, okay, but the, you know, the code is part of the artwork and I want to show it. Um, is that something that collectors are interested in? Not necessarily, but yeah, it was a statement I was trying to make. Uh, and yeah, okay. So um, this, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot more, there's too much. I'm not gonna get into this, but uh, I really recommend reading this article by Ahmad. I had collected some quotes, um, but you can just read the, the actual thing. And uh, I, I might get back to it if we have time, but we probably won't. Okay. Um, so what is the easiest way to make something for FX hash? Probably as a beginner, open processing, believe it or not, uh, has a template for FX hash. I'm not sure when it was last updated. I need to ask Sinan. Uh, because FX hash has introduced new features and so on, but we're not going to get into like the the deeper features of FX hash. Uh, if you want to use FX params, it's uh, it's a whole other complication. You can give collectors the ways to themselves tweak parameters before they mint. There's there's a whole rabbit hole of uh, of FX hash and how to use it. If you're if you're technically minded yourself, um, I definitely recommend reading. The reading the documentation for FX hash, which is fantastic, by the way. Um, it's it's very comprehensive. It is um, it has everything you need, and you should definitely read it because it it highlights a lot of uh, pitfalls that you might get into if you don't want your collection to be removed from FX hash because you're not following some rules that they have. Uh, it, it's a good idea to read to read this, but it's also interesting, and I, I definitely recommend looking into it. Um, yeah, they also have since you know, since the first time I gave this class, they also introduced new features like FX Lens that lets you do some of the stuff I was talking about before, like uh, checking various outputs. I still like FX Snapshot for the fact that it generates a whole bunch of them at once, and you can uh, and you can see them. But here you can 
tweak different parameters and see what happens. Uh, so it's, it's kind of, yes, this uh, dashboard uh, control panel for your collection when you're building it, where you can check out what the outputs might look like. And it's kind of your own uh, FX params for, for you to check things before you mint. Um, but yeah, it goes into a lot of interesting things, including how to price your project and the different pricing models that they have there and sales, like um, different types of auctions that exist on, on FX hash. So yeah, just, uh, just read, up, read that and a code of conduct. Mm -hmm. Very good. So yeah, um, but if we don't want to, uh, yeah, to, to really get into the weeds of using the templates and running VS code and so on, um, we can just go to open processing, create an account, do create a sketch, and then, so yeah, let's go full screen. And then there's, uh, there's something you, you may or may not see it, uh, when you open it, but if you don't see it, you can click there at the top right on this parameter button icon, and then go to this little place there. It's not super obvious, but it says select mode or a template. So mode is up here, but here what we want is a template. So I'm going to click on template, scroll all the way down, and here you see FX hash template. There's a bunch of other ones like shader template, like P5 shader template, blah, 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 even processing Java. But yeah, FX hash template is what we want. And you'll see here at the top left that it contains a various files, four files. MySketch.js, that's where we're going to write our code like we did last week. Um, Style.css, um, maybe you remember I mentioned that, uh, which will define in this case, very little, but how your canvas is going to get stretched and displayed on screen. We want to remove all margins and everything. Um, you typically don't really need to touch this unless you 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 get into like actually minting to FX hash in a way that you want the piece to look good on every screen, including on an iPhone, on in Safari, and so on. Uh, then there are some some extra things that might be good to add there. Um, then we have our index.html, which contains the required FX hash snippet. What this does um, is it replaces the, um, the mechanism by which when you mint on FX hash, you get a hash of the transaction that seeds the piece. This is a very important concept, and actually, I should probably show you how it looks on FX Hash itself. Let's go back to to FX Hash, and uh, oh, you know what? I'm gonna show you one of the things from before. Um, so yeah, let's let's go to Guillaume uh, Cornet's road trip. And if you look at the URL at the top, you will see we have gateway.fxhash2.xyz slash IPFS. So that's our gateway to the uh, interplanetary uh, file system. That's what IPFS stands for, in case you didn't know. Uh, very, very a gra a grandiose name. Mm. And then we have uh, a unique sequence of of uh, letters and numbers that represents our our token, but this is what we're interested in. It's followed by question mark fx hash equal, and then it starts with double O. Which I think it always does. <clears throat> that's that's what a transaction on um, on Tezos looks like. And here we have a unique hash that describes a transaction that uh, was used to mint that particular token, that particular instance of the, of the collection. So if I change this, like even if I change uh, one, one letter, change it by a number, say the last one, and I reload, well, no, okay, if I change just one, it doesn't seem like it changes a lot. <laughs> Let's see. 
That's a curious one. Oh, interesting. So yeah, if I change a bunch of them, <laughs> then it should look different. Yeah, there you go. So this, this is, um, this is the seed. We, we call it a seed. It's, it's what defines which, what are going to be the values of the parameter space, not directly in the sense that it doesn't contain the values of the parameter space. If you use fxparam, you would see an extra, you would see extra parameters in the URL that, uh, that actually define the values of each parameter. But here is just like a unique sequence of letters and numbers that we use to, to make sure that every time you open that particular issue, uh, FX hash makes sure that it looks the same. That's very important. And that's also something that's important in, in creating pieces for FX hash is you're not allowed to have it be random. So if it has a little yellow car there, uh, next time I load this very specific, uh, piece with this very specific hash, it should still be a little yellow car, uh, consistently. And you see like every time I load it, it's the yellow car. It's the elephant car coming back. It's the green alien, like the red alien in the green flying saucer. Every time I load it, it's going to be the same for one given hash. And that's very, very important. And there's something called FX random. That is a, a randomness, a deterministic randomness that is given to you by FX hash and makes sure that every time we get the same. All right. Do we have any questions about this? Because this might be a little technical and I've talked a lot. So you may have, uh, you may have questions. Please feel free to ask. No questions. All right. Well then, uh, let's, uh, where did I go with my, uh, okay, here. Yeah, so to get back to our code, um, the snippet, the FX hash snippet is, is some code that while you're developing your piece, you, you still want to be able to see different variations every time you run it. Uh, you might want to have a new hash be generated. And uh, this, what this thing does is essentially it is generating a random hash for you. So you see it starts with double O, same, and then it creates an array of characters uh, that are picked from an alphanumerical string here. And that's, that's it. That's all that thing does is it's, it's generating a random hash that looks like a transaction hash, but isn't a transaction hash just so that you can make sure that your, your piece is behaving correctly. And once you mint it, this thing will be replaced by, um, it will be replaced by the, the actual mechanism that FX hash uses. Uh, you don't have to remove it. I don't think, but, uh, yeah, FX hash takes care of that at mint. And by the way, I'm using the word mint in two different meanings in this, uh, in this conversation, which may be confusing. Uh, one mint is when the collector mints a piece. Uh, so when they collect it's the collecting action, they buy a piece gets the transaction hash creates a specific iteration of it. And there's a uh, minting as in the artist is putting the art on chain and, uh, putting the artwork on IPFS. And that's like, yeah, when you, when you mint it, uh, when you publish it on FX hash, I'm not sure if technically FX hash in the documentation makes a distinction and you talk it's about minting just for collecting and uh, calls the other action publishing. Um, it's a little bit confusing because if you use Taya object minting is the, is you publishing the art and, uh, but the, the collectors are also minting, uh, that's, well, that's the word we live in, isn't it? So, okay. Uh, and then here we have finally, so a four file, my sketch JS style.css index.html p5 min.js. This is the code for p5 for p5 js but the min means it's minified so all the the returns and like the line breaks and all the spaces that could be removed have been removed 
and that means that the file is a little bit smaller and so it loads faster. You need to include it. You can't use a CDN or something if you know like what a CDN is. So you can't have uh, your code say, oh yeah, please load p5.js from somewhere else. That was possible on Teia. Uh, well, not exactly, but that was, you could call APIs like third-party APIs, a limited number of them, but you could call third-party APIs on, on Teia, on Hiketnung. Actually, you couldn't call a CDN uh, for p5.js, don't, don't believe me. But, uh, um, but yeah, you could call an API. On FX hash, this is entirely, uh, this is not allowed. You can't even call, you, you cannot even call the the FX hash API from a piece on FX hash. Somebody tried and they got their token banned. I still own one. I'm not I'm not burning it. I love it. But uh, but yeah, you can't do the kind of experimental work that I talked about before that you can still do on Teia on FX hash. That's a limitation of FX hash. It's the way it is. They did it for reasons that I totally understand, and um, that's that's the choice of the platform. Uh, so we have to respect it. But uh, but yeah. Um, all right, so this is typically the file that you were going to work in. So let's let's run it and see what happens, right? Uh, we haven't even shown you what it looks like. So I'm running it, and yeah, all right. So this is making a bunch of circles, random circles. If I run it again, well, you won't really be able to see it, but it's going to look different. <laughs> it's not the same circle because it generated a different hash. So we could uh, we, we could do let me see. So it is calling it FX hash. So we could print the hash at setup. Let's see. On soul log FX hash. And let's see what it looks like. So run. Reload. You should see the console. Yeah. So here you see we have a, a hash that ends in MMQU, if I reload again, we have a different hash that ends in ZELW, right? And this is used to seed FX rend that we use here to create the, the position for, for the circles, right? Um, so let's do something different so that it's a little bit easier to understand what's going on. I'm gonna remove the animation. I'm gonna set a no loop. No loop means that when I run the code, it's gonna run the, the setup, it's gonna run the draw, and then it's gonna stop. It's gonna run one, one, one loop, one loop of the draw. Uh, by the way, uh, little tidbits uh, of trivia about p5.js that might be useful for you, uh, the setup, is frame zero, the draw starts at frame one. So if you use frame count in setup, it's gonna it's gonna be zero. If you use frame count in draw, it's gonna be one, two, three, four, etc. every time it runs. So here, if I run this again with no loop, we're not gonna have uh, something very interesting because it's just doing one circle. And there it goes in the corner there. If I But if I run it again, it should be in another place. Yeah, there you go, it's in another place. It's also another size because we're using FX rand times 100. So here it's like, oh, it's very tiny. Um, yeah, there you go. So every time is different. So if we want to do more than one circle, we could use a for loop. For uh, let i equal zero, i inferior to, let's do 100, i plus plus, and then Gonna bring this into the scope of our for loop, and let's see what happens. So if I do this and reload, we should have a hundred circles. Yeah. So see, commit that image to memory. All right. We have a little hole there. We have. Uh, do we have anything that like, we have something here that looks like an eye a little bit? Another eye there. Okay. So now I reload. And it looks completely different, right? <laughs> ready. We have a piece of art that is ready to mint on FX hash. Incredible. Well, it doesn't, it's not responsive or anything because, <laughs> well, it doesn't loop. So it generates one frame and stops. That's fine. 
uh, and we can press space to generate a different one. Okay. No, we can't. Okay, I broke that part. Yeah, let's mint. Okay, let's mint it. Let's mint it. I'm gonna remove the key press. We don't need that. We don't need that. Oh, I love that. Actually, the S might be interesting. Oh yeah, so we can save. So we have a, a way to save. Does it work? Oh yeah, and it has. Okay, it has a transparent background. Why not? Okay, so I'm gonna remove this. Uh, and so the way that we can save this, we go uh files i think no where is it again okay every time i forget how this works <laughs> um i don't myself use open processing very often to to make a piece uh for fx hash well also i haven't made a piece for fx hash in a little while now but um but yeah i typically do it locally in vs code which if you're a developer yourself i recommend doing that with a template and you have more control but this is great for beginners um or if you don't want to bother with a tool chain on, on your computer. Um, uh, um, okay, just a sec. I need to reset my brain a little bit. Uh, I know it's somewhere. Or is it here? Ah, wait a second. I think it's not here. <laughs> uh, or maybe I just need to save it first. Okay, so uh, only me. Only me, draft, uh, fx demo, submit. Okay. All right, all right. We just have a little bit of time left, quick. Um, okay, so that's good. And now, oh yeah, so you have to save it and then you can go there. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then this thing ha appears. Well, maybe it was there and I didn't see it, but yeah. so you go there and then you do download a zip file. So it's gonna, I'm gonna put that in my download folder and then I can just go to FX hash. I hope I'm already logged in. Yes, I am. Um, and I can do mint generative tokens. So I click, click here mint generative token, or I can go to the sandbox if I want to test it, which might be a good idea. It's always a good idea. So I drag and drop it, oop, and say start tests. So see, now it appears here. It can see my files and I can retry with the same hash. Okay, we have a problem. It shouldn't do that. So what's the problem? Can somebody tell me what the problem is here? See what's going on if I say retry with the same hash? What's wrong? Okay, you can type, I'm gonna do something in the meantime. Probably bad random. Yeah, I think there's a there's a there's a bad random somehow somewhere, which is weird. It's a template, we didn't change much, but <laughs> but it is wrong. Okay, maybe it needs updating. Uh, I'll tell Sinan about this right after, and we can uh, we can get that sorted out. Um, I mean, I'm saying we. He's gonna sort it out. <laughs> but uh, yeah, let's uh, let's do one one thing quickly. Uh, so, Phil, I want to change the color so it's a little more obvious what's going on. And it's gonna be FX rand times 255 three times for color, so I can change the color. Never trust a template. <laughs> yes, save, download. Wait, let's run it. Let's run it quickly just to check. Yeah, okay, so now it's a little more like a generative, piece of generative art. Um, I want to try so I have to do something. Why do I <laughs> can't I stop? Okay, color mode. Color mode HSB. Let's do it right. Let's do it right. Let's do it right. It's gonna be let hue equal FX friend 360 because hue is of a 360. 
saturation 90 brightness 100 and hue uh ah yeah and we can do like let no yeah let hue default default hue equals fx rand uh no, fx rand lowercase uh, times 360 okay and the hue is going to be default u plus fx rand uh, map fx rand from 0 to 1 to minus 10 10 it's not it's not super it's not super accurate but it should it should be good okay there's 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 going to be a problem with this code but uh, uh, where did I put a dot that I shouldn't put? An expected error. No, where's the dot? Oh, console log dot. Oh yeah, okay, sorry. The let here, stray, a stray let. Okay. No, fx friend is not defined up there. No, no. Uh, all right we'll we'll get there we'll get there default hue equals and if you don't follow what i'm doing but don't worry i don't either apparently but yeah there you go so so now it's going to be a different base color with some variation that's good okay so yeah but at least you see what it looks like to to iterate on a on a piece so yeah now now we have like some a bit clearer a bit clearer thing um it's still it's still going to be broken by the way uh for some reason i'm not sure why uh something to do with the with the template but yeah now we can update our zip uh download i'm gonna put the new one you try with same hash. Yes, it should have updated. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's broken. Let's reload the sandbox. Put it on. That's a uh, yeah. There you go. It didn't update properly. But yeah, retry with the same hash should keep the same value, and it doesn't. So we have a problem. And uh, yeah. <laughs> That is that is something you need to that is something you need to try. Uh, by the way, now it looks like we do get also the the wallet address of the mentor. So you could do something that looks different for each person. Though, well, no, it doesn't look different for each person who looks at it, but it can look different based on the person who mints it. Uh, bye, Carolina. Yeah. Okay. Where so once you're done and assuming that it works, so. You should look different only when you use a new hash, not when you use the same hash, but we're not going to fix that now. You should go to mint generative token. I have carefully checked my zip file. Time to mint. It's not a collaboration, it's just me. Zip. Upload. And then you see a very similar uh, thing to the sandbox. Now retry with the same hash, still broken. Oh no, it's not. Wait, the sandbox is broken. The sandbox is broken. <laughs> ha! The sandbox is broken. What? What? Oh, that's one with that's one for Cypher then. That's not one for Sinan. Okay, I need to, I need to check the sandbox. Okay. So anyway, yeah, retry with the same hash seems to be working fine. So yeah, new hash should always look different. Same hash should always look the same. Then, uh, okay, well, address we're not we're not using the address, so, so nothing happens. I want to keep these settings for the preview of the project. This is uh, the thumbnail that will appear for the project, so you can do that or you can uh, not do that. 
uh, my generic token works properly. Otherwise, it doesn't let you go to the next step. So you have to confirm that you think it's good. Um, when will the capture module trigger? Fixed delay is like it runs for two seconds and then um, captures a thumbnail. And or programmatic trigger, you can add something called FX preview, and we could have included this in our code, like right here after this, we could do FX preview uh, because we're rendering only one frame anyway. So that would be fine. And then I could say, yeah, use FX preview. Now I can't because I haven't included it in the zip, but that, that will work fine. Um, yeah, so I guess it doesn't, doesn't even need to, to wait two seconds. Um, what will the target the capture module be from canvas viewport capture? Uh, yeah. And then if it's canvas, I can, uh, I can say, I can tell it the name of the canvas, which in, um, uh, in processing, I think it's called default canvas zero, uh, something like that. I'm not sure if that would work. Best capture, probably not. I'm sure I forgot something, uh, but yeah. By default, I can do viewport capture, and that, that's the that's the easiest. Yeah, it works. But if you want a little more control, you can use FX preview and then uh, capture the actual canvas. Um, and uh, yeah, if you're using shaders and so on, you can use a GPU and uh, enable render instance, but in that case, we don't need that. Next step, then you need to check that those two look the same. They do. Next. And that's where you define the price. I'm not going to get into that. That's a little out of scope for today. But uh, but yeah, you can uh, define the price. And then uh, you have a couple more steps, which are about, I believe, defining the like the description for your piece, uh, what description appears. You can have a separate description for when somebody mints. It looks different for them. Um, and uh, yeah. I'm not sure exactly what the what the rest of the process was anymore, but yeah, let's uh, let's put some default stuff. You can uh, split the primaries, uh, and uh, you can make donations, which is definitely recommended. You have a bunch of possible donations, but the the only one that counts. <laughs> who wants to cure Parkinson's when you could give to the Processing Foundation? And uh, yeah, this, this is obviously a joke. I'm sorry. Uh, apologize. <laughs> it's in poor taste. No, of course, we want to cure Parkinson's disease. And uh, yeah, uh, you can define royalties for yourself. Uh, you can have separate royalty splits from uh, first like uh, primary splits. So when your pieces get minted the first place, you can set royalty splits um, that you may not want to carry to the secondary market. And uh, yeah. Uh, reserves. That's if you want to keep some extras. Yeah, okay. I don't want to get get into this. Um, not enabled yet. Uh -huh. This is how you define whether you want people to be able to check infinite number of variations before before getting uh, one. And after the mint is over, uh, whether you want people to still be able to do that. Uh, yeah, then your description. And th I think at the end, the final check. See that before we wrap up, test. Yeah, you can put a number of uh, content warnings. Uh, it's not animated, it's not uh, blood of or gore. It's not a PFP project. Yeah, final preview. Yeah, and then you see that's this is how it would look. We allowed infinite variation so people can explore that. We can reload, we can stop it, uh, run it, and uh, that's it. Yeah, then you can publish the project. I'm not going to do that because uh, it's uh, it's not exactly my vibe, but but yeah, there you go. Okay, well, precisely on time. That's <laughs> done. Clap. Ah, okay, good show, everyone. <laughs> uh, if you have any questions, please ask. Uh, you can also, again, reach my um, my own Discord. We have a channel uh, called uh, Clean NFTs where you can ask questions like for specific questions about NFTs. If you have questions about P5 or generative art or creative coding in general, uh, technical questions or creative questions or so on, there's also a help channel and various channels about different uh, technologies, including P5.js. 
Um, yeah, that's uh, that that's that was all for me today. How was it? Did you learn something? Was it scary? It was a little more dense than last time, so I hope it was still still able to uh, to get value out of this. I'm gonna turn off my screen sharing. All right. Uh, you looked over the FX hash documentation before, and this is much easier for you to understand. Well, I'm glad to hear. Yeah, there's there's so much more. This it's as I said, it's like a it's a rabbit hole of of uh, more things that you need to know if you want to, or that you can research if you want to get into more more detailed, more complex projects. But for the basics, this should be enough. And again, uh, this whole class, as every class for, from VCA, will be on YouTube eventually, so you can rewatch it if you missed something, uh, sc scrub through it, find the part where I talk about this or that point, and feel free to come and uh, ask questions on the Burbs Nest Discord. That's my Discord, where either I or some of our friendly community members will, will reply. You miss people to talk about P5, etc. Yeah. Well, you're very welcome. Cool. All right. Well then, people, have a wonderful rest of your day, whatever time of day it is, or night. Uh, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to learn a little bit about genetic art. Bye, everybody.